high choice. Uh, I'm sure you guys all seen that video. If not, that's totally fine. Uh, yeah, my name is Justin and a, I'm also a Hoper like yourselves. I attend Hope and I've been attending Hope for about 10 years now, and which is crazy to me. I was thinking about how many years I've been attending here, but it's already been 10 years. So if you stay in San Diego after you graduate, I'm sure you'll also get to that soon. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, uh, today I've been given the task to talk briefly about um, God's calling in your life, your identity as a believer, and how you can navigate through this um, big topic of calling slash vocation and how you we ought to approach in uh, the question of how do you find the calling in the age of many choices, many crises, and confusion in this world. And so I've entitled this whole seminar, God versus the Magic Gate Ball. And we'll uh, briefly discuss that as we go further into the seminar. But uh, here's a shameless self-introduction about myself. Uh, as you can see, my left side is a derpy face. Uh, this was taken, I think, in 2016 or 2017. That's when I was still single and uh, ready to mingle. But... Uh, yeah, I wasn't dating anyone then, uh, but then some very special woman came into my life in 2018, and um, and we started dating, and I am now a husband of one wife, a very beautiful one wife named Esther, and, um, and I will briefly talk about this later, but um, I used to actually have the same position as Solomon. I used to work as a pastoral intern for the College Ministry of Hope Church from 2016 to 2019. And it's been a great experience uh, there. And I probably shouldn't, you know, talk too much bad experiences about it because PJ was also online. Uh, but I, I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. Um, but yeah, I'll briefly talk about that later, uh, later in the seminar. But uh, yeah, after that brief uh, moment of uh, serving in the ministry for a little bit, I have decided to step down and have tried to pursue um, secular vocation. And now I have been working as a data analyst for a defense uh, company. So my main task right now, if you guys are curious, uh, I can't talk about it too much in detail, uh, but mainly what I do is uh, organizations like Navy, Air Force, and Army, they come to our company and say, hey, these are some of the national security problems that we face. And let's say if we were to invest certain capabilities in the future, how much better are we going to do in the future in a war fighting scenario? And so we would run some analysis for them. And then we would say, hey, these ABC things that you can work on, it will make our, uh, uh, our soldiers much safer and you'll be able to uh, do your campaign and mission level stuff uh, more safely and more effectively. So that's some kind of kind of the stuff that I do for my current company. But if you're more interested, uh, you can you can you can message me uh, afterwards and we can talk about it more in detail. Big brain stuff. It's not big brain stuff. I'm sure you guys can do it too. But I, I, I do have a question and I want you guys to participate in this too, which, which is, uh, can you guys guess what my major was in college just based on uh, the, the brief introduction that I gave you guys? You can chat it out or you can you can you can you know, unmute yourself and answer. And if you do know the answer to the question, please don't say it. <laughs> but history? Wow. CS, theater. <laughs> Phil, I'm going to kill you. I mean, I think there's anything wrong with theater, but uh, something in STEM. Data science. Oh, great. Poetry, art, econ. Great. Those are all like, <laughs> wow, theater. I didn't expect that. Uh, but yeah, I did, I did graduate with um, joint mathematics and economics in undergraduate degree, uh, which has nothing to do with, you know, seminary, right? But uh, if you can believe it, since like sophomore year in college, I started thinking about, do I want to pursue ministry or not? So it's been a while, uh, but I did decide to uh, major in mathematics and economics. Anyhow, so but before I get going, though, I do want to mention that, you know, that as much as this is a seminar, I want this to be a discussion slash a dialogue. So please feel free to ask questions uh, throughout the whole seminar. And I really love would love to hear from you. Um, and 
you know, if it's a if it's a question that I'm going to address later down the road in the seminar, then I will say, hey, if you can just wait a little bit, then I I'll, I'll definitely mention that. But if it's pertaining to the topic that I'm talking about, I, I would gladly love to uh, to address that question. So please feel free to ask questions throughout the seminar. Okay. So before we go too deep into the topic, I do have some questions for you all to consider. So the first question I want you guys to consider right now is, have you ever asked God, what major job slash career should I pursue? So give me a thumbs up if you have asked this and prayed about this. Uh, is there a thumbs up? Oh, there it is. Looks like a lot of you. Great. So the next part of the question is, do you think you've got a sufficient answer to this question? from God? And that's a bit of a trick question, because if you did hear that, then you probably would not be attending this seminar. But uh, yeah, I'm sure you guys are all here because you guys are curious, right? But I guess somewhat related to that question, and I don't have the answer to this question, and, I, and this is totally open-ended. I want to really hear from you guys is, why do you think you're so curious about what you want to do? Give me, give me some, give me some uh, opinions and perspectives. You can unmute yourself or type it money, security, meaning of life, I like that. Don't want to regret decision. It's a good one. Anyone else? Any other thoughts? Yeah, I want you guys to think about it a little bit. <clears throat> Maybe one more person? No? Be prepared for the future, right? I think these are all great answers and I think those all um, kind of shed light into why we all are curious about this topic, right? And I think, and I'm gonna briefly talk about this later in the seminar too, but in my perspective, I think we tend to ask these questions because um, we currently live in a society where we do have many, many, many choices, right? Back in the day when during our parents or even our grandparents' generation, uh, these kinds of questions didn't probably occur to them because, you know, what they were going to pursue was very limited, right? But now that we have this plethora of choices to make and create education system we have, we, we can actually make choices and that actually scares us, right? And as you guys have mentioned, we, we, we tend to think about well, what is going to be the, uh, the, the picture of my life 10 years down the road and I don't want to make the wrong decision if I, you know, you know, once I think about this and make the wrong decision and I don't want to regret it in the future. So. I think part of the reason why I think we are uh, so curious is because we are uh, fearful of uh, making the wrong decision and we're fearful of the failures that we might make. And I think we are also uh, as, I, do people still use FOMO, that, that term? No, yes, I don't know, maybe I'm just dated, but I think FOMO is a real thing, right? Like you, you, you really do fear the, of missing out on something that you should be like doing, right? Old man, just... thanks, Nathan. All right, but yeah, and we will briefly talk about this in the in the seminar later. But but the last thing I want you guys to kind of think about throughout the seminar is this: if God were to ask you, rather than you asking God, if God were to ask you, what do you want to do? How would you answer that question right now? Okay, so. You don't need to. You don't need to chat it out or anything. But I want you guys to have that in the back of your mind as you, uh, as we have this seminar together. Okay. So I think uh, I've tried my best to make this more simple and uh, more clear. So I think there are going to be four different parts that I want to hit, which is uh, let's see what our God, the Word of God, says about uh, this topic. So wisdom from the Word. Second is we're going to try to navigate through how does the world interpret this question for themselves. So it's wisdom from the world. And thirdly is just my, purely from my perspective, what I've learned. So I'm going to give you guys some of my two cents about this topic. And then fourthly, we'll wrap this up with some question and answer. Okay. Do you guys have any questions so far? Awesome. 
Alrighty. Cool. All right. So let's get into it. Wisdom from the word. So I think it's important to understand, you know, as believers, we all, we all want to be biblically focused, biblically minded about anything that we think about. And, but before we tackle that question, I think it's important for us to understand uh, what is the scope of scripture, right? Um, it, Oftentimes, I think we become disappointed by the answers we get from the scripture because we're not asking the right questions to the things that scripture addresses. So I think it's important for us to understand, okay, what does the scripture say? And what is the, what is the, what is the scope of scripture? What is the scripture about, right? So I think scripture, I think it's pretty clear uh, in 2 Timothy 3.16, it exists because, anyone know this verse? Any Bible experts in college ministry? And as much as I'm testing you, I'm testing Solomon, right? How well he's doing his job. Anyone? It is God breathed one. Oh, that's that's good. Any any uh, further details? No. Ah, Solomon. Oh, scripture. Profitable. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. You guys are all helping each other. That's very good. So I think if, if I'm not misquoting, I think 2 Timothy 3 says, uh, all of scripture is God breathed and it is profitable for teaching and reproof and uh, able to equip a uh, man of God, right? In righteousness. And so I think that sheds light into what scripture is, which is all of scripture is meant to give us uh, or to prepare us and equip us to be the man, man and woman of God in righteousness. And I think if scripture talks about some topic, then it's really important for us, right? So let's see what, uh, let's, let's now dive into like what scripture says about this particular topic of, you know, vocation slash calling, right? So for those of you who were in my Bible studies before, you probably have heard this before. And Pijos time to time mentions this verse too, Deuteronomy 29, 29. But when we talk about God's will for your life, what do we mean by that? You know, because God has multiple wills in the scripture as, as scripture points out, um, and I think it's important to distinguish that because you and I also have multiple wills, right? And, and what I mean by that is uh, when we say God's will, that can be interpreted as God's will of disposition, which means, you know, what does God actually want? My, God's desire is that everyone will be safe. That's God's disposition. But that doesn't mean that God's going to make that come to fruition. But it's just, it's just God's desire that everyone should come to, come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, right? But nonetheless... I think broadly speaking in scripture, there's two different wills of God that you, you and I probably have to distinguish. And the first thing is God's revealed will. And the second thing is God's secret slash uh, um, uh, hidden will, right? So Deuteronomy 29, 29, does anyone know what that says? Without looking at the Bible. Anyone want to take a huge stab at this? No. No. Once again, Solomon has failed you. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm, I'm just picking on Solomon. But Nathan knows? Okay, Nathan. God has multiple. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Uh, actually, can you guys turn there if you have your Bible? Uh, I think it's important. And I want you guys to see it for yourself. Hooray. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Nothing has changed about you, Daniel. Deuteronomy 29, 29. You guys all there? Yeah, give me a thumbs up if you're there. Great. So Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this. The secret things belong to Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. So the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed to us and to our children, uh, the, um, it, it's, it's good that we do all these things for the words of God. So as you can see, there, there are distinctions, right? There are things that belong straight to God and to God alone which is secret will of God. And there are things that he has revealed to us, which is the revealed will of God. So 
as we read this text, I think we naturally come to this question, right? Then what is revealed for us and what is what is not revealed to us, right? And I think when it comes to the topic of vocation, uh, our vocation, I think this text kind of sheds light into how there are two different things that God really wants us to focus on, which is there are two different callings for a believer, which is the first is a primary calling, which is fixed. And does anyone want to guess what that primary calling for us as believers is? Evangelism, okay. Missions, okay. I kind of gave you guys a hint by putting the, the sub bullet point there. But I think generally speaking, yeah, like evangelism, missions, very great stuff. Um, but I think it's all incorporated into this word Christian. Your primary calling is a Christian. You're a believer of God. And what does that mean? Because uh, I think Jesus answers this question very well when some, uh, uh, some guy comes up to him and asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life, right? Do you know what his answer is? His answer is basically, you know, love God, the Lord, with all your heart, mind, and soul. And second is like it, which is to love your neighbor as yourself, right? So by these two different things that, 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 that all the laws are summarized, right? So I think Jesus lays it out very clearly that our mission as a believer is to love God and to love our neighbors, simply put, right? And what does that mean? Practically speaking, I think that calling is very specific to the believer because it means that we ought to love, worship God on Sundays, to be part of a local church and to love our neighbors by doing evangelism, by, you know, inviting them to our homes and cooking for them, going on, you know, short-term or long-term missions. Those are all incorporated into this what's called a primary calling for believers, right? So I think that's revealed to us in scripture very clearly, right? And which means it's fixed. That identity, that calling, that vocation as a believer cannot change for you and I, right? But I think all of us, when we ask the question of vocation, that, that now falls under the category of secondary calling for believers, which I think uh, from my perspective, and I think uh, from what I've seen in the scriptures, I think that calling is fluid, which means that it can change, right? Is there any quick question here so far? I'm going to go a little bit deeper into this in a bit, but are there any questions so far? Cool. All right. So continuing on, I, I just wanted to kind of convince you that I think this is the case, that our secondary calling is very much fluid and it's, 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 uh, it's subject to change because I think we can see this very clearly in two different or three different case studies, right? And number one, I, want to, I, want, I just want to bring up our Lord Jesus as our number one case study. Have you guys thought about this? I was thinking about this topic as I was preparing for the seminar, but I was like thinking about this and it occurred to me that, you know, if scripture really wanted us to think deeply about our vocation and our calling and it's so fixed, then why doesn't the scripture talk deeply and in depth about how Jesus pursued his vocation as a carpenter for his 30 years of his life, right? And I think that's very interesting because in, in the gospel of Luke, Matthew, uh, Matthew, Mark, and John, there's basically no information about his life from his, you know, birth to his, uh, to his life in, uh, before he starts his uh, earth, uh, earthly ministry, right? Uh, it just talks about how, like, you know, he was, he was born and he was baptized, and then he starts his ministry right away. Talks about his temptation briefly, uh, but then he just starts off his earthly ministry. And the only hint we get about his childhood is Luke, uh, transition from Luke 2 to 3. And I'll read it for you guys. It's kind of, it's kind of crazy. Uh, Luke chapter 2, 3 transition goes like this. This is when uh, the boy Jesus enters the temple and then he starts speaking and then uh, he and then uh, his parents are like, where is Jesus? We lost him. Like, we're going to find him. And then they find him and then. Uh, that Jesus goes like, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house at 12 years, at 12 years old, old? 
And then it says this before it moves on to chapter three. It says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And I think the key important part here is, and Jesus increased in wisdom. And I bring this up because uh, after that verse, it goes into chapter three, which basically starts his earthly ministry as, you know, 30 years of age. And I think that just sheds light into how uh, our secondary calling, which may be being a doctor, being engineer or whatever, those things are uh, fluid in nature and that God doesn't necessarily uh, mm, pinpoint out that that's what we have to do. Because if being a carpenter was so important for Jesus, then he would have probably said, you know, God the Father really wanted Jesus Christ to pursue, you know, his vocation as a carpenter. Jesus probably pursued carpentry because, you know, his father was also a carpenter. And that's what he just basically just inherited, right? So that's just one study case you can see from our Lord Jesus that our, our vocation wasn't uh, uh, meant to be fixed like that, right? And I think the second case study we can look at is the disciples and everyone else, right? All the disciples were fishermen, you know, tax collector and things of that nature. But then uh, it, it doesn't really talk too much. The scripture doesn't talk necessarily too much of how they came to that position or how they decided to, you know, pursue that specific job, right? It just says that they were tax collector, they were fishermen. And then when they met Jesus, they started following him. That was, that, 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 that transition is very short. And I think that just sh sheds light into how uh, our vocation was never meant to be uh, this thing that we care so much about, right? Although it is important. Um, so it comes to, to my last point here in the wisdom from the word, which is, uh, I think our secondary calling, as I mentioned, is fluid in nature. And I think about this. We all, you and I have always asked the God, you know, the, asked to God the question of like, what should I do for my major? What, what job should I pursue? And imagine if God gave you a response, right? God actually responded to your answered prayer. And his answer to your question is nothing that you've actually expected. Let's say, uh, what, let's say, what, who's studying, you guys studying like medicine, anyone here, biology? biology okay let's say you're, like, you're studying biology right now and you ask god you know what should i do for a major and you know I, i'm thinking about going to medical school and then he says no you're going to drop everything and pursue mathematics would you do it just think about that i i think i think that i, I would go crazy because uh that's not what i've been expecting and that's not what i desire to do right and this is why i think god isn't your magic eight ball as we expect him to be you guys all know magic eight ball how it works like you shake it and then you get the answer like you know like, you know what should i do for you know for you know what should i you know what should i eat for my dinner tonight and then, and then it's like oh eat cheeseburger or whatever i i don't think it says that but uh it just basically gives you an answer for you right but i think god is too loving to give you guys and you and i the answer that we're seeking for the reason why is because I think God is so wise and so sovereign and so loving to the point he takes into account of our desires as human beings, and he wants us to rely on the wisdom of our friends, our neighbors, our pastors, and uh, the people who are around us who know, who know us really well and really rely on their counsel to find the, uh, the questions, uh, the answer to the question that we're seeking after, right? So that's the main point from this part of uh, uh, the wisdom from the word section. Is there any question? No question so far? Great. Yeah, and you can ask the questions later too. But I'm going to move on and I'm going to briefly talk about wisdom from the world now. Right? So I don't know if you've ever seen this kind of diagram before. Has anyone seen this kind of diagram before where there's like three circles and then it's like the intersection between those three circles is like what's called your vocation or slash your calling that you should all pursue. Give me a thumbs up if you've seen this diagram before. Okay, Samuel, I've seen it. Oh, no one else. Oh, I'm surprised. Ella, oh, most of you, Nathan, 
Great. Yeah. So I think this is pretty much like, uh, uh, I mean, you, you'll see variations of this diagram floating around anywhere you, you know, you type in Google and you're like, oh, how do you find your vocation slash calling in your life? You'll, you'll definitely encounter something like this, right? But those three circles represent basically on the one hand, on the first circle basically represents desire. Like what is your main desire, desires of the heart? What do you want to pursue? What do you love, right? And the second circle basically uh, can be summarized into this one category of gifts. What are you actually good at? Are you good at mathematics? Are you good at, you know, memorizing uh, scripture, memorizing history? Um, those kinds of things, the skills that you think you're good at. And then the third broad category is uh, opportunities. So what opportunities are open to you and slash like what, you know, what actually serves the world uh, with your gifts and talents, <clears throat> excuse me. So those are the broad three topics that the, uh, I think the world recognizes as important things when, and when it comes to deciding your vocation slash career. And as you can see from this diagram, that orange spot right there is the sweet spot, what they call, where when you think about these things and where those things intersect, that's it's probably a good calling that you can pursue, right? So I don't know if you guys know who Robert Iger is, but Robert Iger is a ex-CEO slash chairman of the Walt, uh, Walt Disney, Walt Disney Company. And I, I've been reading his uh, autobiography and he, he says something very profound that uh, I thought it was, was worth sharing. And someone asked him basically like, how do you know what decisions to make? for a big company like yourself, right? And he basically gives this response, which I put on the slide. He says, if something doesn't feel right to you, then it's probably not right for you. If something doesn't feel right to you, then it's probably not right for you. And I mean, I, I want to tread on this uh, carefully because like, you know, sometimes you want to persevere. You, you have to distinguish between, am I just being, you know, uh, just being, um, am I just seed in a season of, in, in a season of dryness and I just need to persevere or is it something that I just, it's not right for me, right? Those two things you have to kind of like, uh, think about, um, deeply and you can't come to that decision too quickly, but in the general sense, I think Robert Iger is right. If something doesn't feel right to you, then it's probably not right for you, right? Like you might have the desire, um, to pursue data science or something like that. But then like deep down, you don't, you really don't know. You really do know that this isn't right for you, then it's probably not right for you, right? Uh, and like your parents are forcing you to, you know, pursue medicine or something like that, but then you just don't feel it, then it's probably not right for you. So that's one uh, wisdom from the world that I, I wanted to share. Is there any question here? No? Cool. So another wisdom from the world that I wanted to share is there's another book that I've been reading called The Range. And this is written by an investigative reporter by the name of David Epstein, which I highly recommend. This book came out in 2020. And I think it really is a important book. I wish this book came out when I was in college and I wish I read it. Um, but so this, I'm, I'm recommending this to you guys. This isn't a Christian book or anything like that, but this is an investigative reporter's perspective on um, uh, on, on the world that he sees, right? And basically the subtitle of this book is Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World, right? And basically the, the premise of this book is that it's, he distinguishes two different, uh, two different jobs or two different categories of jobs that people have, which is one, you can be a generalist, which means, you know, you can dabble on different subjects and topics and domains of interest. And you can look at those things in a more general, uh, in a, in a more general way, or you can pursue a career that's more specialized, which is, you know, uh, you know, uh, like software engineering or, you know, uh, medical field or things like that. If you're a very specialized uh, uh, vocation, right? And he basically comes to the conclusion that generalists at the end of the day, in the long term, outperform people who are specialists, right? That's, that's, that's his main point. And he, in the book, basically distinguishes also the difference between uh, what's called a safe slash kind environment versus 
a wicked environment. And you know, you can see from the quote that I gave to you guys here, well, he talks about a wicked world, but he's just talking about a wicked environment, right? And basically safe and kind environment as he talks about it is basically an environment in which you work and you have problems and the rules of the game are really well specified and you get immediate feedback to all the things that you do, right? For example, like if you're, you know, I think school is an example of a safe slash kind environment, right? Once you take the test, you get immediate feedback, you know what to do next to do better, right? Like you have to study certain topics and you know that you will do better. So that's a very safe environment. But I, I think in a wicked environment, as he describes it, all those rules and boundaries of the game are not clearly defined and you don't get immediate feedback. And an example of this that he gives is, uh, let's say you're trying to look for a cure for cancer, right? That's a very wicked environment because all those rules that you think about in, in the scientific industry, those, those things kind of uh, don't really apply when you're thinking about research on, uh, on a cure for cancer because you, know, you can't, the rules are not clearly defined. You're the one who's creating the rule to find out what the best uh, option is, right? So all this to say, he's saying that more and more as we grow into a world where uh, AI technology and um, uh, technological advancements are going to take over uh, jobs that are very specialized, right? You know, uh, whether it's uh, as a bank teller or anything that requires accounting, those are very specialized roles and they're going to be pretty much be dominated by AI slash uh, technological advancements that we see, right? But he's saying that more and more human beings are going to have to live in an environment where it's a wicked environment where rules are not clearly defined and you have to kind of uh, think creatively about the problem sets that you're seeing. And so this is the quote that he gives in the book, which I thought was really good. In a wicked world slash environment, relying upon an experience from a single domain slash single uh, uh, area of expertise is not only limiting, but it can be disastrous. So I mentioned this primarily because I think it's, it's always embedded into our heads that uh, the more you put time into some, some, some subject, then you end up becoming a specialist and that's always a good thing for you, which is you know, generally true because we have you guys heard of the 10,000 rule? Like if you put in, in any one skill that you can think of and you put in 10,000 hours into it, then you'll be an expert at it, right? And he gives like uh, in the book, he gives uh, basically uh, two different examples of two different really famous athletes, but who have totally different upbringings like Tiger Woods. He's been playing golf since he was like two years old or four years old. And he put a lot of time into golfing. And he became an expert. That's great. But then he also gives an example of Roger Federer, who didn't start playing tennis until he was like 12 or 14, even though even though his mom was a, a tennis coach. Right. And because before, before he got into tennis, he, you know, dabbled on soccer or basketball or things like that. He was trying out different sports and, you know, he, he's a really, really well-known uh, famous tennis player, right? So he gives those two examples as, uh, as a case study. Is there any question here? I feel like I kind of like went through that really fast, but, but I highly recommend this book to anyone who thinks about, who's thinking about, is it better to like, you know, specialize in one domain or is it better to like dabble on different subjects and is that okay? And I would definitely recommend this book to you. Any questions? Great. So now come to the point where I kind of want to share my, uh, the lessons that I've learned throughout this whole process. Um, but one thing I do want to mention uh, in sum, after, you know, looking through the wisdom from the word and wisdom from the world, I think one thing that I do want to kind of emphasize and uh, speak to you guys about is it's okay to not know. It really is okay to not know what you want to do right now. And, and uh, as you can probably imagine, uh, I was 25 when I decided to step down from ministry and to start pursuing a career that I never thought I would pursue uh, back in college, right? And I had a lot of confusion at that time. A lot of confusion. I was asking the, uh, the kind, same kind of questions that you're probably asking to God right now. And it was very, very difficult. And it was, it was so frustrating and upsetting to not know the answer to the to the questions that you were asking. And 
and I want to be very uh, transparent with you all. And so I just want to read you a brief excerpt from the journal entry that I've read. I've written as I was like thinking and, you know, uh, praying through this as I was looking for a new job uh, after I had decided to uh, stop pursuing ministry, right? So I hope you don't mind. And I, this is my first time sharing my own personal journal entry. I don't think even my wife has read it. So uh, here it is, honey. You can read it too and you can hear it. Uh, here's, a, here's a prayer that I've written in March, uh, March in 2019. One thing that I don't understand, Father, is that you knew from eternity past that I would uh, enroll in Westminster Seminary, go on missions for the past however many years, and with that intention that I was going to pursue ministry. And you also knew that, you know, I would be meeting and dating Esther. And somehow, in, in some ways, all these, all these things would contribute towards in me uh, taking a break from seminary. I guess I'm not supposed to know why and what your plans are. Yes, I'm fully responsible for my decision, but you're also absolutely a sovereign in every decision that comes to pass. Lord, as I'm working and waking up every day, I feel so restless and lazy. I keep thinking to myself, I should be doing more. I should be doing this and that. There really is no end. And this is my personality. I feel like I should be doing more and I can't take a break. I'm scared, Lord. A part of me thinks that I know this isn't true, but somehow you're disappointed in me for quitting and that you can't allow me to find a job or internship as a form of punishment. I know that this is not true, but I can't help but to feel this way. As you can see, there's a lot of inner turmoil Turmoil, uh, as I was thinking about this, right? But I want to read you another excerpt from back in May in 2019. Uh, this was the, the, the month end of May was when I actually found a job and the current job that I have. And I was still thinking about finding a job. And it says this, times of anxiety and uncertainty hit me at, ran uh, at random times, unexpected times. When I think I'm good in trusting his provisions, all of a sudden I would feel anxious and lack of confidence, desire to get up and keep living my life. And this week was one of these times. And I also realized how much checking my phone and a constant vibration on my wrist, which is talking about Apple Watch, has also contributed to my anxiety. Will this be an email from the workplace that I've applied to? I should get away from them for a bit. But more than anything, I just want to remember that this shaky season from which I want to be delivered, maybe, just maybe, God's way of delivering me from something else, the end of myself, my pride, and idolizing success. Perhaps the Lord is challenging me to redefine what success is. So... I want you to know I'm sharing this because uh, it's not easy. I, I've defined it, you know, very clear. I, I hope I probably defined it. Try to try my best to define clearly um, what the right steps are and what the right wisdom that you can pull from to make your decisions. But making this decision is really messy. And I just want to share my excerpts from my, my journals to reflect that. Right. So. But all this to say, I want to mention that your confusion as you ask questions and as you think about this more and more and as you talk to your friends, your confusion will ultimately turn to curiosity and that curiosity will ultimately turn into conviction. So make sure to know that it's going to take a, a while and it's okay to take a while and it's okay to not know right now, but make sure to know that, you know, just to be patient with yourself um, and ultimately your confusion will turn into conviction. And I firmly believe that. Uh, second thing I want to mention is that uh, you want to pray, right? As, as believers, we, we're not working by ourselves, we're working um, with the power of God that, that he provides for us on a daily basis. But I do want to urge you and encourage you to pray not for answers to your questions, but for courage, but for courage. And the reason why I say this is because, you know, Whenever you go to a retail store nowadays, like when you look at an item and you want to buy something, what do you do? You check your phone first, right? What do you check on your phone? You check the best price. Like you're asking yourself, am I getting the best price that I'm seeing right now? You, so you go on Amazon and you see, hey, is this the right price? And then you check, right? And the reason why I mentioned this example is because, you know, we often, when we ask questions, we think that we're going to get an instant, instantaneous and immediate response, right? But I think something that's complicated in this nature 
is uh, you're not going to get an immediate or a spontaneous response, uh, right? And we briefly talked about this FOMO, right? We, we, we sometimes don't want to uh, make the decision for ourselves because we think that we're going to make the wrong decision and we're going to regret it in the future. And Robert Iger also talks, talks about this. Robert Iger, the, the ex-CEO of Disney World, Walt Disney, he says that basically fear, fear of failure leads to risk aversion. And risk aversion is a terrible strategy for businesses because it allows you to not innovate and to think more creatively, right? So I think even the world recognizes that risk aversion is a bad thing and fear of failure is, uh, is a root for that. So I wanna just urge you all to pray, not for specifically for answers, but for courage to move and to move forward. Um, and I think that will help us in, in down the road as we pray for that. And third thing I just want to practically mention is, uh, is to ask and seek other people, right? You're, you're put into an environment. I mean, it's kind of hard right now with COVID-19, right? We can't really meet in person. But once this is over and we come face to face and worship with other believers, guess what? We have really like tens of people who are working in different industry, different sectors of economy. Uh, whom might be a good point of contact for you if you're interested in what they're doing, right? And these church folks are amazing. I, I've talked to many of them, and I've just listed out a few example of people, what they do at our church, but they're financial analysts uh, in our midst. They're status analysts like myself. They're program managers. There's also teachers, pastors, you know, software engineers, mechanical engineers, medical practitioners, and human resources. And there's a bunch more that I probably did not list. But I mentioned this because I think we tend to not talk to uh, our church folks who might be older than us because we, we're kind of fearful and we're shy. But it really, like... I had to get over the fact that unless I ask and seek help, then uh, I might not receive help. So it's better to just, you know, be bold and come up to them and say, hey, like, I've heard that you're a financial analyst. Uh, what can I do? What would you, what kind of advice would you give me? Right. I think that would be a, a, a really good advice I want to give to you guys, because when I was looking for a job, there is a, a deaconess in our midst whose name is Carrie. And she really, really helped me a lot, even though she's not a data analyst or anything like that. She's a program manager, but she gives he, she's given me so much good advice. And I think because of her, I was able to job, find a job really quickly. And so really just be bold and ask a lot of questions. And I haven't met someone who doesn't like to talk about their job, right? They, they really like, uh, they're probably in their industry or their job because they love it and they like it. So I would really encourage you guys to just seek out and talk to these different people. And fourth and lastly, I would try to adopt a generalist mentality. You know, it's good to specialize early, but I think even in our education system, we're forced to specialize too early, right? Even by your junior year, you have to, you know, um, specify your major and you have to like follow through with it or else you can't graduate, which I totally understand. But I think it's important to adopt the generalist mentality rather than a specialist mentality specialist mentality because for a generalist they have a pro uh, they, they have an advantage over specialists in that because they have so much uh, knowledge in different domains of life they can apply different problem solving skills to a specific problem that specialized people cannot solve and so i think that that'll be a really really good mentality to have as you seek out which vocation slash calling you want to pursue and last thing I want to say, this is the last slide before the question and answer, but our good old professor, Michael Horton, I don't know if you know him, but he's a Westminster Seminary professor and he's written this and this has encouraged me and has uh, given me a lot of freedom and it lifted a lot of burdens for me. But he says this, we have to see that God makes us for all sorts of different callings. You don't just choose one calling, you choose many over a lifetime. So go with the set of gifts and sense of God's pleasure that fits with your life right now. Don't worry about other callings, especially those that may lie in the future. Just be who God has called you to be right where you are with the people he has called you to serve. So I'll just leave you with that. Um, and are there any questions? <laughs>